Hello, and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 28, Work and Energy. Well, if you are in my Physics 1 course, you are nearing the end. We have just two primary lectures left, meaning we have really two topics left to introduce. And those two are really the namesake of this lecture. We have to introduce work and energy. So the goal of this particular lecture is to basically set the foundation. We need to get ourselves uh, somewhat familiarized with the basics of work and energy before we can actually bring it all back together in lecture 29 to talk about conservation of energy. So let's go ahead and begin by just re recognizing the fact that when you have a system of interacting objects, they have a total energy. And energy is a word you hear all the time, right? We use chemical energy to heat our homes and bodies. Uh, we use electrical energy to run our lights and computers. We even use solar energy to grow our crops and forests, for example. We're told to use energy wisely, not waste it. Athletes are uh, wary of students. Uh, I'm sorry, athletes and weary students will uh, consume energy bars and energy drinks. So really, we need to better understand what energy really is. So again, our goal here is to just get familiarized with a few different types of energy and then how that energy is used in these different systems. So when we say we have a system of interacting objects, that system is going to have a total energy represented by the capital letter E. When we say total, it's the word total in math. Total means the sum. So when we say a system has a total energy, we mean you add up all the different energies that are there to get this total. Now, there are many different kinds of energy. For our purposes, we're going to introduce five of them and only use four of them. There are other types of energy. The first and most relevant type of energy that we will ever deal with in the course is kinetic energy, given by capital letter K. Simply put, this is the energy of motion. So literally all moving objects will have this type of energy. And for our class, I mean, I'm never going to give problems on a homework or an exam where it's just an object sitting there and nothing's happening. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It's one you'll see in pretty much any problem you do. Next up is gravitational potential energy. There are multiple kinds of potential energy, so we're using subscripts for the symbol here. U, capital letter U, is the symbol for potential energy. The subscript G denotes that it's gravitational. We'll talk more about this soon, but when we say potential energy, we mean energy that is stored and waiting to be used. In this case, gravitational potential energy is the stored energy associated with an object's height above a surface. So in this case, if your object is being lifted off the ground or moving up a hill, you will see a change in this type of energy. Next, elastic potential energy, sometimes called spring potential energy because it's often associated with springs. It's potential energy, so it also gets the capital letter U, but in this case we have the subscript S to denote the spring nature of it. Being potential energy, this is also energy that is stored and waiting to be used. In this case, that is when a spring or elastic object is stretched or compressed. And this is when you can feel pretty directly. If you just take a somewhat rigid spring and try to stretch it out, you can feel that spring trying to pull back in toward the equilibrium position. Same if you compress it. Say you have this, a, a fairly rigid spring, imagine just pushing the outside edges of the spring inward to compress it. You can feel that in your hands, that energy waiting to be used because it wants to push back out against you. Now, the gravitational potential energy is one that is a little bit harder to feel directly, but anytime you lift an object off the ground, there is energy stored there because when you let go of that object, it's transformed into kinetic energy, energy of motion but we'll get into more of that soon. This brings us to the fourth type of energy we will deal with, and this is thermal energy, given by the capital letter E and subscript TH. This one has a technical definition. We will elaborate on this in our next lecture, but the basic idea is that this is the sum of all of the kinetic 
and potential energies of molecules in an object. That is a pretty technical definition, and at face value, it doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We'll talk more about what it really means, but think about what temperature means. The hotter an object is, you should hopefully know this outside of physics, hotter uh, objects mean the molecules within them or the atoms within them are moving faster. So that's why we're talking about kinetic energy here. The faster your molecules are moving, the more kinetic energy they have. But in a solid, especially for example, your, your molecules will be attached via bonds. And as the molecules are moving quickly with kinetic energy, they are stretching and compressing their bonds more and more, meaning there's more potential energy there. So that's the quick primer on what thermal energy is. We'll talk more about that in our next lecture, but in a very basic sense, we're just saying that the hotter the object is, the more thermal energy it has. So those are our four main types of energy. There is a fifth one I will just mention because we will talk about it in passing, but it is not one that shows up in our math. And that is chemical energy, E subscript chem. <laughs> We're really running out of symbols and ways to represent these things, but E subscript chem for chemical energy. Now, this is one that goes beyond the scope of our physics one lecturing, but this is the stored energy in molecular bonds that is released during chemical reactions. Uh, I'll give you an example of that in the next slide, but um, for now, that is our face value definition, and we'll get to more on that soon as well. So, total energy could be the sum of all of these different energies together, which you see in the picture in the bottom right. Your total energy E is the sum of all individual types of energy, kinetic, gravitational potential, elastic potential, thermal, and chemical. That being said, not every system deals with changes in all of these different types of energy, so it's usually not as complex as it can potentially seem at the moment. Well, these different energies can be transformed into other kinds. Energy transformations are always taking place around us, whether we really realize it or not. It's really just a factor of, are you thinking about it or not? Energy transformations happen everywhere, all times. It's a very common thing. I'm just gonna give you three completely random examples of them. These aren't math examples. These are just examples of a situation that is occurring. So in the picture on the top right, you see a baseball player sliding to a base. He is running and sliding. So as he's moving, he has kinetic energy, right? He's moving and sliding across the ground. So he's got kinetic energy. But as he slides against the ground, there's a lot of friction involved that friction is going to generate a lot of thermal energy, meaning his legs and the ground are actually getting warmer during this sliding process. He's also slowing down. So he's losing his kinetic energy as he slows down, but gaining thermal energy as he warms up. We're already hinting at a, a sort of conservation of energy here. Example two, this is the chemical energy example. Again, we will not deal with chemical energy in our math or even really in any way beyond this example. But when carbon in the wood combines with oxygen in the air, we have a chemical reaction. So chemical energy is transformed into thermal energy. It's the heat that you feel from the fire. So this is a combustion process. But um, anyways, uh, so that's our chemical energy example. And then my favorite one out of the three is the last one, because this actually shows two transformations in a single example. So here in the picture, you have a diver on a diving board or springboard. At the point in the picture that's shown, you can see that that board is bent pretty considerably downward, meaning there is a lot of elastic potential energy stored in that board. It wants to snap back upward into place. So there's a lot of stored potential energy there. Well, as that starts to bend back upwards, that's going to launch the man upward into the air. So it's turning into kinetic energy, the energy of his motion. He starts moving upward. But that's not all. Because he is moving upward, he is moving further off of the ground. So he is gaining gravitational potential energy the further off the ground he goes once that board launches him up into the air. So that stored energy in the board turns into kinetic energy of his motion, and then his kinetic energy of motion is turning into gravitational potential energy to raise him off of the ground. 
So again, there's these types of energy transformations occurring all around us. Well, as if things weren't confusing enough with physics, here we're talking about transformations. Now we're talking about transfers. So be very careful about the distinction between transforms and transfers. So I put in here just a way to compare the two. Energy transformations are changes of energy within the system, just turning one energy into another type. An exchange of energy, however, between a system and its environment is called an energy transfer. And there are two ways that these transfers typically take place. That's either via work or heat. Work is the one we will focus on in our class. We don't discuss heat very much. That's, again, somewhat beyond the scope of our class. We'll still talk about some thermal energy, but not the process of heat in detail. So work is considered to be the mechanical transfer of energy. So a physical transfer of energy, something coming in and physically forcing an object to move. In this case, when we say force, we're talking about pushes or pulls. So if you do work on an object, you are physically pushing or pulling on it. On the other hand, heat is the non-mechanical transfer of energy to or from a system due to a temperature difference. So for example, if you touch something cold, the heat leaves your body, and so there is a transfer of heat, and so energy is being transferred, your thermal energy really is being lost. So in these examples you see in the photo, you have three different ways work is being done on an object. In the left picture, you have a shot put being thrown. So the athlete is doing work on the shot to give it kinetic energy, energy to move. In the middle example, we have uh, somebody striking a match. So you are physically exerting a force on it. You are doing work, giving it thermal energy. And in the last example, you have a boy with a slingshot. Very clearly, as he, the boy pulls that elastic band backward, he is doing work on it to give a lot of elastic potential energy stored up in that string, because then when he lets go of it, that would go flying away. So at this point, we now have a basic definition of work and a basic grasp of energy, which means we can put them together now. This brings us to a very important concept of the work energy equation. When you do work on a system, you are transferring energy, right? That's really what we said in the last slide. Energy transformations are changes of energy within the system, but an energy transfer is an exchange of energy. So you are changing the amount of energy. So that's an equation, right? The amount of work you do, W, is equal to the change in energy as a result of that work being done, delta E. So this is the work energy equation, and it's the foundation of several math problems that students in my course would uh, deal with. So very clearly though, if you look at this equation, if no energy is, is transferred into or out of the system, it is said to be isolated, meaning no work is done. So really what we're saying here is if no energy is transferred, we're just saying this is zero. So then, I mean, zero is zero. There's no work being done. So that is the definition of an isolated system. If that is the case, in other words, if your system is indeed isolated, we say that the energy is conserved. There's no change of energy. There's no gain of it. There's no loss. So it is conserved. Okay. Well, at this point, we have our definitions down, right? We've We've somewhat defined work. We've said it's the non or we said it's the mechanical transfer of energy due to a force, and we've defined our different types of energy. But the problem is we don't have any mathematical way to represent them at this point. So let's take a look at how we can define work mathematically, in other words, with an equation. So what we're gonna do is build an equation for work. By definition, again, work is the transfer of energy to or from a system. Work is done by external forces, that is, forces from outside of your system. So something coming in to push or pull on your object. Well, if you want to do more work, 
there's one of three things that can be changed to make that happen. The most obvious is applying a greater force, right? So if you apply a greater force, you are doing more work. So if we wanted to build an equation for work, we could say it's directly proportional to force. So if you were to increase the force, you would increase the work. Okay, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. The more force you exert, the more work you are doing. Well, beyond that, how far you are pushing the object will also matter. In other words, it's the, di the displacement, D. The further you push the object, the more work you're doing. It doesn't matter how big the force is. I mean, if you're pushing it a greater distance, you are doing more work to move it that distance. A quick note here, uh, it is a little bit annoying, but in the past, in our course at least, displacement used to be written as delta x or delta y. For whatever reason, the book changes to using D for displacement when talking about work, and I am following that notation. So this can be somewhat confusing for students um, in my course just because we do switch from a displacement being represented as delta x to D. Um, I don't honestly know the exact reason for that. I'm sure it's some sort of standardization because the equation for work typically uses D across any book. Uh, but anyways, just note that D in this case does mean displacement, how far the object has been moved from its initial point. So we have F and D. The last thing that matters is going to be the angle at which the force is applied. Now, if you look at this picture on the bottom right, you can see an object is moving straight to the right. So this little buggy or this vehicle here should hopefully only be displaced along the surface, right? This is moving straight to the right. Even though there is a component of the force upward because of the wind, it shouldn't be lifting off the ground. So what that actually means for our discussion here is that we can sort of set up a way to define our angle. If we recognize this as being a triangle, we can say there's an angle here between the force and the displacement. That angle will matter in terms of how much work you are doing. If your force is in the exact same direction as your displacement, you are doing the most amount of work. But imagine for a second that your force, for whatever reason, was straight up, perpendicular to your displacement. Well, in that case, you're not doing any work because you aren't contributing to the object moving forward anymore. So what we're getting at here is that the angle matters. In this case, look at the triangle. We have displacement on the bottom. So this is our adjacent side of the triangle. The force, oops, the force there is the hypotenuse. So if we want to include an angle into our work, we need the trig function that uses adjacent and hypotenuse. That's cosine. So our equation for work is Fd cosine theta where in this case, uh, theta is the angle between your force and your displacement. Now, since this is a new unit or a, a new variable that we've introduced, work, we want to make sure we understand its units. Looking at this equation, we have a force times a displacement. We know that we measure force in newtons, and we measure distances in meters. So the unit of work is a newton times a meter. But we give this a new name. By definition, one newton meter is a joule, J-O-U-L-E, represented by capital J. So uh, whether, you write F, uh, whether you write your units as newtons times meters or joules, both are correct. Um, but we should get familiar with writing our units as joules for reasons you'll see, especially soon when we reintroduce our discussion of energy in the next lecture. So uh, at this point, I just want to mention one thing because I think it's really important to see. Work can be negative. So I'm going to take a moment to just show you a few situations that will change our work being done. In this situation you see, 
you have a box being pulled straight to the right. So in this case, the displacement is straight to the right, given by the blue arrow, and the force is straight to the right, given by the red arrow, or the fact that the rope is being pulled straight to the right. So in this case, you have an angle of zero degrees. If you're unfamiliar, cosine of zero is one. So your equation, work equals fd cosine theta, will simply just be FD. It's positive, and it's the maximum amount of energy you can do on that object. Or, excuse me, the maximum amount of work you can do on that object. So that is your most efficient work, pulling straight in the direction of the displacement. Well, if you then take that rope and angle it a little bit, you still have uh, an angle, let's say, I don't know, let's say 45 degrees in this case. Well, in your equation, you're still going to end up with a positive value. All right, so it, for any angle between 0 and 90 degrees, you plug that in here for theta, you're still going to get a positive value back. But it's going to be smaller because uh, cosine of any angle between 0 and 90 is less than 1. So you're going to make your work smaller. So you still have positive work being done, but it is less of it. So then, if you increase your angle even further to 90 degrees, so the object is still moving to the right, maybe somebody pushed it initially, and so it's moving to the right, but you try pulling up on it a little bit. In this case, just imagine it's a really, really heavy box that you can't lift. So it's just sliding across the surface and you try to lift up on it. Well, the angle there is 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is zero. So in your equation, work equals fd cosine theta, that just becomes zero. You don't do any work. You aren't contributing to that object moving or being displaced, so you aren't doing any work on it. So be very careful. You, there are situations where you can exert a force, but you aren't doing any work. And that's when they are perpendicular to one another, your force and your displacement, that is. But keep increasing that angle, and now you start pulling against the motion of the object. So if the object is sliding to the right, but you start pulling back on it, you're exerting a force in the opposite direction. In this case, straight in the opposite direction. So this is uh, 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 is negative 1. So you can do negative work. I'm just trying to emphasize that because sometimes if, I, if this isn't emphasized uh, and you calculate something in a problem and you find out you get a negative value for work, conceptually in your mind, that, you know, it's hard to, for that to make sense. How can you do negative work, right? So be careful. Uh, if you work against the displacement, you are doing negative work. You're acting against the motion of that object. Okay, well, to conclude for this part of the lecture, let's go ahead and just work out a very basic example. Uh, this is a rare example where there's not much to it, but I think it does help to see it worked out. So in this example, it says a, it's 120 meters from one gate to another in an airport. Use a strap inclined at 45 degrees to pull your suitcase through the airport. The tension in the strap is 20 newtons, so how much work do you do? All right, well, in this case, we have an equation for work, right? It's our FD cosine theta equation. So in order to solve this, we just need to make sure we know the force F, the displacement D, and the angle theta. Well, I mean, all of those are given to us. Uh, in this case, the force is the 100, or excuse me, the force is the 20 newtons. The displacement is the 120 meters. And the angle is 45 degrees, right? Because we're looking for the angle between the displacement, which is along the surface, and that 45 degree angle of the tension. That's 45 degrees. So we actually have everything we need. The one thing I'm gonna do here though, and I'm doing this on purpose, I'm gonna rewrite this equation, but I'm gonna swap out the F for T because this is a tension force being used. 
At this point, we already know what the tension force is. It's 20 newtons. But anytime you were given a different problem, what if it was, say, friction that was doing the work? Or weight, for example. If that was the case, then instead of tension here, you could plug in, say, your kinetic friction or your weight. And maybe you aren't even given the weights. Maybe you're given the mass, and then you'd have to plug in mg instead. So my whole point here is just that whatever force you have, I would write it out using its letter. Um, that way, you are very clear about what's being inserted into your equation. So again, for this example, we are already given the tension. So we don't have to do any extra work. But it could be a different force. It could be mass, it could be friction, etc. Or excuse me, it could be weight or friction, etc. So anyways, uh, at this point, we do know everything we need to solve. So tension is 20 newtons. Uh, displacement is the, what am I doing here? 120 newtons. It's a really bad 120, but you can use your imagination. Uh, and then this is cosine of our angle, which is 45 degrees. So 20 times 120 times cosine of 45, this will give you approximately 1,700 joules. Now, in this case, you are doing work. And remember, work causes a change in energy, right? We have that work equals delta E. So because we are doing work on the system, we must be changing its energy somehow. So I tend to ask my students in class, where do you think that energy is going, right? We're doing work, so what energy is being generated here? It's actually fairly subtle, but this is actually mostly turning into thermal energy between the wheels and the uh, surface of the ground uh, due to the friction between them. So that's not important for solving this problem, but um, the work being done is mostly turning into thermal energy. Okay, well at this point, let's just go ahead and close out our lecture with a few questions. As always, I encourage you to pause the lecture so you have a second to think about them before you hear the answer. Question one, a child is on a playground swing, motionless at the highest point of his arc. What energy transformation takes place as he swings back down to the lowest point of his motion? Okay, so uh, we have a child on a swing out at the highest point of their motion. They are going to swing back down to the lowest point. So as this takes place, Right now, when they're up at the highest point, they have a lot of gravitational potential energy. We'll say their maximum amount. But they have no kinetic energy because they stop for that one second at the peak of their motion. But as they move back downward, at the lowest point, they have no gravitational potential energy because they're back at the ground, but they have their max kinetic energy. So as they are moving downward along this arc, they're losing their gravitational potential energy because they're moving downward, but they're picking up speed because they're gaining their kinetic energy. So the transformation that's taking place is gravitational potential energy turning into the kinetic energy of the child's motion. Okay, question two. Robert pushes the box to the left at a constant speed. In doing so, Robert does positive, negative, or zero work on the box. Okay, well, in order to figure this out, we have to know the directions of the displacement and the direction of the applied force. In this case, notice that the displacement is to the left. So this box is being displaced leftward. The force, in this case, that Robert is exerting, if you look at this, he's pushing to the left. So the box is moving to the left. Robert is pushing to the left. So what does that mean? Well, the angle between those is zero degrees. 
So if you remember our equation, work equals F D cosine theta, if you plug in zero degrees cosine of theta, it goes to one. So this is gonna remain a positive value. He does positive work. This problem tries to trick you by showing that it's moving to the left, which would mean it has a negative velocity because negative is uh, the leftward direction. But be careful, the, the uh, angle for work is the angle between the force and the displacement. They're both in the same direction so you have a zero degree angle and thus positive work being done. So be careful uh, with your directions when talking about work. To reinforce this, let's do one more example that does a similar thing. A crane is lowering a girder into place at a constant speed. Consider the work done by gravity, WG, and the work done by the tension, WT, which is true. So you're basically going to do this for both. Figure out if the tension is doing positive or negative work, and then figure out if the weight is doing positive or negative work. Keeping in mind that this is lowering. Okay, so I'm going to just start by drawing a free body diagram, just to kind of reinforce the direction of everything. So um, we know that there's a weight pulling downward and a tension pushing upward or kind of pulling upward. So we are told that the displacement of this object is downward, right? I'm not using the best colors here. Um, let me stick with yellow. So the object is being displaced downward. Our tension and weight are pointing in opposite directions. Weight is pointing down tension is pointing up. So weight is pointing in the same direction as the displacement. So weight is going to do positive work. So that means we can rule out C, D, and E because those either show work being negative or zero. Okay, so because the work is in the same direction as the displacement, that due to weight is positive. On the other hand, the work done by tension, tension's pointing up, the displacement is pointing down, those are in opposite directions. It's acting against the displacement of the object, so it is doing negative work. So the answer is B. The weight is doing positive work, the tension is doing negative work. The way I think about this is, the weight is acting to help move the object downward. The tension is working against that. It's working against it, so it's negative. Uh, okay, I'm gonna skip over one and go to our last one here. Uh, so question five. A light plastic cart and a heavy steel cart are both pushed with the same force for a distance of one meter, starting from rest. After the force is removed, the kinetic energy of the light plastic cart is what compared to that of the heavy steel cart? Okay, well, let's analyze this using the work energy equation. We know that work equals a change in energy. In this case, we're talking about kinetic energy, so I'm going to write this as delta K, and over here we have work, which is given by Fd cosine theta. So really, the work energy equation here is expanded out to Fd cosine theta equals delta K. Well, we need to know how the kinetic energies compare. Well, based on this situation, we're told that they have the same force. The same force is applied, right? Same force value F. The displacement is the same. We're told that it's the same displacement, uh, was it one meter? And looking at the picture, it's the same angle. Right, they're both being pushed straight to the right. So the force is the same, the displacement is the same, the angle is the same, so everything is the same. They are going to be equal to each other.
they will have the same kinetic energy. One is more massive, but it's not going to end up moving as fast. So it kind of balances things out. So it is going to be equal because all other things in the equation are equal. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our lecture 28. When we jump into lecture 29, we are going to reintroduce all of our forces, our kinetic, our gravitational potential, our elastic potential, and our thermal energy. And we're going to reintroduce them and define each of them with an equation because we will then put all of that information together to talk about conservation of energy. Until then, thanks for watching and have a great day.